The humanities connect us across time and cultural divides, offering insights into people, places, events, and ideas. Humanities scholars illuminate these connections in their work, revealing previously unrecognized, sometimes unexpected links that advance our understanding of the human experience in profound ways. For instance, a path that leads from slasher films to abolitionists. The movie Friday the 13th is considered one of the first women in danger slasher films, a genre fascinatingly analyzed by NHC fellow Carol Clover. The movie was also one of the first film roles for actor Kevin Bacon, who was a subject of Finding Your Roots, a series by NHC fellow Henry Louis Gates Jr., where it was revealed that Bacon's ancestors, as well as those of his wife, actress Kyra Sedgwick, were early opponents of slavery and helped abolish the institution in Massachusetts in the 1780s. Today, NHC fellows continue to do groundbreaking work fueling critical discussions about modern day slavery and oppression. Your support makes this work possible. Please consider making a gift today and helping us shine a light on all that connects us to one another. The humanities connect us across time and cultural divides, offering insights into people, places, events, and ideas. Humanities scholars illuminate these connections in their work, revealing previously unrecognized, sometimes unexpected links that advance our understanding of the human experience in profound ways. For instance, a path that leads from slasher films to abolitionists. The movie Friday the 13th is considered one of the first women in danger slasher films, a genre fascinatingly analyzed by NHC fellow Carol Clover. The movie was also one of the first film roles for actor Kevin Bacon, who was a subject of Finding Your Roots, a series by NHC fellow Henry Louis Gates Jr., where it was revealed that Bacon's ancestors, as well as those of his wife, actress Kyra Sedgwick, were early opponents of slavery and helped abolish the institution in Massachusetts in the 1780s. Today. Hello, everyone. And welcome to this evening's Fresh Off the Press book talk. This series of talks features National Humanities Center fellows discussing their recently published works. I'm Matthew Booker, Vice President for Scholarly Programs at the Center, and it's my pleasure to serve as the host for this evening's event. Before we get started, I want to remind you that to participate in the discussion, you need to log into YouTube by clicking on the blue Sign In button in the upper right-hand corner of your browser screen. This evening, it's my pleasure to introduce award-winning historian, Andrew Jewett, who is currently Elizabeth D. Rockwell, Distinguished Visiting Professor of Ethics and Leadership in the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston. Andrew received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 2002. And over the last 20 years, he has worked to increase our understanding of the role science has played in American society since the late 19th century. Prior to his current appointment, Andrew worked for 10 years as a member of the history faculty at Harvard University. He has also held positions at Yale, Vanderbilt, New York University, Boston College, and Georgia College and State University. His scholarship has been supported by fellowships from the U.S. Department of Education, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Education, the Cornell Society for the Humanities, and the Center for Historical Analysis at Rutgers, as well as from the National Humanities Center. Andrew's first book, Science, Democracy, and the American University, From the Civil War to the Cold War, detailed how leading thinkers in the late 19th and early 20th century championed the scientific enterprise as not only a source of technical knowledge, but also as a resource for fostering cultural change, ideally suited to the needs of a democracy. Andrew's second book, Science Under Fire, Challenges to Scientific Authority in Modern America, resulted from his work, as a, his work at the center as a fellow in 2013 2014. In it, 
Andrew reconstructs a century-long battle over scientific authority in American culture. From critics who espoused a range of social, political, and theological views, and demonstrated how this conflict has shaped political decision making since at least the 1920s and continues to inform public attitudes on important topics from climate change to COVID 19. Science Under Fire was awarded the 2021 Society for U.S. Intellectual History Book Prize for this year's for that year's best academic work, as well as the 2021 S-USIH John Dewey Prize, the Triennial Award for the Best Book on the History of American Philosophy. In that competition, judges noted the broad scope of Andrew's research, encompassing philosophy, theology, humanistic fields, social sciences, and political commentary, as he considered how negative attitudes about science were not simply irrational responses to objective facts, but attempts by people to come to terms with their changing world. Andrew has graciously agreed to speak with us about his book this evening and to answer questions about what this history of cultural conflict means for us today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Jewett. Andrew, it's a great pleasure to have you. And I'd love to turn over the floor to you at this time. Great. Okay. Thanks so much for that introduction, for moderating. I'm going to go ahead and share here and see if I've got my slides going. Okay. Does everything look okay on that end? All right. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Matthew. Let me also take just a moment here at the beginning to thank the center uh, for inviting me to spend that incredibly productive year there in the Triangle area. Uh, the research I did that year and the time for deep, sustained thinking really made this book what it is. That kind of support from the center has been so valuable for so many scholars over the years. It's really an unparalleled resource. Let me start in 1948 with a philosopher named Bernard Phillips. He was the chair of the philosophy department at the University of Delaware. And he later uh, ran the religion program at Temple. He's an interesting character. He was born Jewish, then considered Quakerism, but eventually became a Buddhist instead. Uh, later in his life, uh, he cleared a patch of land and built a cabin by hand. Uh, but back in 1948, he was writing on an upsurge of interest in the humanities over the past decade, the previous decade since the late 1930s. And looking back at that period, we might be inclined to say that the revival of the humanities in the U.S., in the World War II era reflected a felt need to celebrate the Western heritage in the face of the Nazi and then eventually Soviet challenges. This is a common interpretation of the mid 20th century humanities in the US, but to Phillips, this surge of interest was a sign of something else. It was a sign of a recognition of the profound corruption of Western culture through and through. And he started by arguing, as you see here, that the sciences and the humanities were not just sets of disciplines that vied for space in the curriculum. Of course, they were also that. But that deeper down, they embodied two mutually exclusive philosophies of human nature. So what were those philosophies? Phillips drew a familiar distinction here. Science studied objects, while the humanities studied subjects. Uh, and that being the case, science couldn't say anything about human beings as such. So a thoroughly scientific education was an education that necessarily omitted humanity. And Phillips says this is not just an abstract problem, but it's also a deeply practical one because questions about the curriculum are also questions about the direction of society. Only if the universities emphasized a non-naturalistic approach could human beings truly flourish, the realization of selfhood was their goal and their goal alone, not that of the sciences. And then Phillips put this conflict in an even broader context. He said all over the West, people were starting to realize that a naturalistic outlook was responsible for the calamities of the 20th century. So that defending humanities in the mid 20th century required warning citizens about those terrible real world consequences of a naturalistic worldview, its tendency to objectify, to eliminate the human subject, which led straight to the totalitarian state. And so Phillips argued, just to sum up, that the humanities embodied a distinctive philosophy 
of the human person that could stave off collectivization. Now, was this typical of the post-war humanities? Let's look at a few more examples from the time. Some figures were less concerned about science's cultural influence. So here's the historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. in 1949. And he says, sure, the viewpoint of the social scientist is terrible, and it's taking over the universities, uh, but still that view is relatively contained. It's not doing great harm in the wider society. It does not yet define the culture. Uh, but Schlesinger's analysis was, was kind of unusual in the post-war humanities, and note that it came fairly early after the war. As time went on, especially many observers traced much uh, broader and more damaging effects to the cultural influence uh, of the sciences and especially the social sciences. So by 1962, you can find this MLA committee urging members of that organization to stop lambasting a technological society and identifying the humanities as an antidote to its shortcomings, urging them to embrace American culture in a normal future oriented view. Okay. And yet the criticism went on. Here's the historian Jacques Barzan in 1964, two years later, saw tremendous opposition to the cultural influence of science through the whole post-war period, unceasingly cried out against the tyranny of scientific thought. Uh, and I should say that he was not looking at this critical discourse from the outside, just reflecting on it. From the 1930s forward, Barzan himself repeatedly lamented the impact of science on the modern world. And here on the inset below his picture, there is a, the whole book he eventually wrote on the subject there in 1964. This is from that book, Science, the Glorious Entertainment. Uh, and his critique always had a practical as well as a theoretical edge. So among other things, Barzan uh, was one of the most prominent critics of the fluoridation of water supplies in the United States. Not what he's usually remembered for. And in general, this kind of criticism is not widely noted today. Uh, again, as I said, we tend to remember the post-war humanities as overly celebratory. Uh, along the lines of the MLA committee statement, we see the post-war U.S. as this, uh, you know, the era of Western Civ courses and the canon, an uncritical embrace of the social status quo in the face of the Soviet threat. Uh, and then looking across American society more generally, there's been a tendency recently to see a cresting wave of what's often called high modernism in the years after World War II, uh, to assume looking back that nearly everyone at the time believed that scientific experts could and should control society in all its details, that science and technology ruled the roost and hardly anyone doubted their essential goodness. But this is obviously too simple. Uh, Barzin was exaggerating a bit, but he was not far off the mark. Uh, Charles Frankel, who became the founding director of the National Humanities Center, uh, wrote in 1973, a couple years earlier, that the 20th century has been marked by an almost unbroken series of challenges to the authority of rational methods of thought. Uh, and as I show in the book, these challenges produced bitter controversy in the post-war years. They tore through what we remember in hindsight as a unified liberal establishment. Okay, Some of the leading uh, post-war figures, many of the leading post-war figures embraced liberal policies and practices, a general sensibility, uh, but they opposed what they called modern liberalism as a political philosophy, a cultural framework. They said that liberal thought and culture had been thoroughly corrupted by the influence of science. And this was why the Western world was undergo undergoing a total crisis. This is the period in the 1950s, especially the late 50s, when the term scientism takes hold as a name for this underlying error, uh, usually in modern liberalism itself, this mistaken overestimation of science's capacity and promise. And many of these themes carried forward into the 1960s and beyond. Uh, some of them are still with us today, though they've changed in important ways as well. So these are the arguments I trace in the book from the 1920s forward. I don't spend a lot of time on uh, what would seem like the most obvious group to discuss, which would be theologically conservative Protestants. And of course, their attacks on Darwinism uh, and more recently climate science uh, have been very important. But I wanted to explore a much broader and I think even more consequential kind of skepticism among all kinds of other groups that had no problem with the theory of evolution. And they took issue instead with scientific theories of human behavior in particular. Uh, some of them came out of biology, some of these theories, but mainly from the social sciences. 
And for them, the problem wasn't that these theories clashed with biblical texts, but rather that they contradicted accounts of behavior and personhood that seemed obviously right and true, really just a matter of common sense. So this argument had three parts, and it goes first, scientists misunderstand people. Uh, they've just got us fundamentally wrong, right? Uh, but how much did that matter? Some crit critics like Schlesinger stopped there, uh, but most went on to the second point, which is to say that this mistake has had terrible consequences, okay? It is now a scientific age. This phrase is very common. Modern societies are scientific societies. Science has become the lens through which everyone sees everything, including themselves. It's not churches or politicians or Hollywood or advertisers who shape the culture and define people's self-understanding. It's science. And for that reason, all kinds of social problems can be traced to science's influence. And this is a style of argumentation, these, this sort of three-part framework you can find again and again and again in US history, going back uh, to the 1920s. But notice how vague it is at a lot of points. I've marked a few. How is the scientific view faulty? Okay. How does it influence the wider society? How does it set that tone? And then what are the particular problems it causes? And then beyond that, what's the solution? What's the alternative, the right way to view human beings? Where is that view found? Is it in a particular religion uh, or in religion in general? Is it a matter of humanistic learning? Uh, is it uh, an inheritance from a philosophical or political tradition? Is it just simple common sense? An enormous range of different groups with conflicting agendas have adopted this interpretive framework that I trace in the book. And you'll probably notice as I, as I go through the example, several differences of terminology and emphasis as I describe various figures. And there's a lot more to be said about those differences. But in this project, I'm mainly concerned with the common threads, uh, partly because they allowed these figures with, again, vastly different views to directly influence one another inspire one another and draw on one another. There are webs of citations mixing together people that we couldn't imagine being in the same room sometimes. Now, notice too that in this context, especially this argumentative framework, uh, offers a new way of justifying or validating the humanities. Uh, it gives a new reason why colleges and universities should fund research in those fields and teaching and give them a central place in the curriculum. And of course, as you know, there are lots of other ways to make this case. The humanities provide valuable linguistic skills, knowledge of the cultures of other times and places, uh, close reading skills and so forth. Uh, but then as now, there's also been a temptation to say something larger, something uh, political, even civilizational. Only the humanities can save modern society from itself. In the 19th century, the argument was often that moderns needed to recover aspects of ancient culture through the classics. In the 20th century, many defenders of the humanities arrayed their disciplines against what they saw as a scientific culture in all of these different ways. Uh, but the commonality here, too, is that the social problems had an intellectual cause and required an intellectual solution, a change within the universities and disciplines. And these other rationales for humanistic study didn't disappear, but this was one of the big arguments in the mid 20th century, and it's still sometimes heard today. I wanna to come back to that point at the end, but let me give you just a quick overview of the rest of the talk. I've been emphasizing figures in the humanities, but I also wanna introduce you to an array of other post-war critics to give you a sense of the breadth and the flexibility of this discourse. And then later I'm gonna briefly run through five important points of transition in my narrative. I'm first gonna discuss how and why this critique took shape in the US in the 1920s. I'll then touch on the 30s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, 90s. Each period brought important changes and additions. And that takes us up to the present century. And I wanna finish by just talking for a few minutes about science and the humanities today. But let's turn first to uh, the other kinds of critics of scientism after World War II, starting with religious leaders, okay? As I said, it wasn't just conservative evangelicals by any stretch. 
you could find folks of just about every theological persuasion making this kind of argument. Uh, so here's uh, Fulton Sheen. Virtually every Catholic leader in the post-war period took this kind of approach. And in their particular case that they said the influence of science had made modern societies hopelessly secular. Uh, so Fulton Sheen is a, a longtime commentator on the dangers of scientific naturalism from the 1920s forward. He's extremely influential. He has a radio show and then switches over to television, reaches millions and millions of people every week, and is consistently sharply critical of the direction of modern thought. He had actually said during World War II, science today is the enemy of man. Uh, and then in 1948, he explained that applying a scientific lens to humanity led straight to collectivism. The person as such disappeared in theory, and then they inevitably disappeared in practice as well. Now, uh, a large and influential group of mainline Protestants also offered versions of this argument. So here's Reinhold Niebuhr, the famous theologian, public intellectual, a frequent commentator on international relations. Uh, like Sheen, Niebuhr had lamented the influence of science since the 1920s. Uh, that critique figured uh, more or less in all of his writings, including this famous 1952 book, The Irony of American History, which we, we remember mainly for its uh, kind of consensus narrative of the American past. But he issues this kind of condemnation there as well. He, he says, a scientific technocratic culture eliminates the morally free individual, both in theory uh, and in practice. And in fact, he says in this book that the materialism of American culture is essentially the same as that uh, of the Soviet Union. The only difference is that Americans haven't just given social scientists power, but they would do the same thing with it in the United States as they had under Stalin. This is not nearly as common a view among Jewish scholars, but it did appear there as well. There's a particularly strong version from Will Herberg. Herberg was a former Marxist who went back to Judaism after reading Niebuhr's works. Uh, and you may know of his 1955 book, Protestant Catholic Jew, enormously popular and influential, where he announced that Catholics and Jews were now accepted as good Americans alongside Protestants. Uh, but he was also all throughout a ferocious critic of secular culture, including secular education. And in this book a few years earlier, 1951, Judaism and Modern Man, he says Western civilization has utterly collapsed uh, because Westerners had embraced scientism and therefore all value had been squeezed out of the world. Uh, that uh, we needed a postmodern outlook that recovered traditional religion. Now, within the universities, but beyond the humanities, lots of other scholars offered similar kinds of arguments. Some identified religion as the antidote. Others looked to a humanistic outlook that might be based in the humanities, but could find expression in other fields as well. Natural scientists often saw the post-war world this way. Many of them were deeply suspicious of their counterparts in the social sciences. And in general, this, this emerging nexus of expertise and state power, even though they themselves were helping to build those connections as well, they were particularly concerned when the social sciences got involved. And so one biologist, for example, said he would rather perish in a nuclear holocaust than live under a scientific tyranny. And this kind of concern was especially widespread among the atomic scientists who had developed the bomb. Folks like Conant here, after the war, they suddenly feared that they had too much influence rather than too little as they had thought before. And they worried that their fellow Americans were going to expect too much of them, expect them to magically remake both the social and the, and the physical worlds. Uh, so Conant is a chemist. He's one of the most prominent who says, no, science can't do that, no matter what the social scientists might promise you. He's the longtime uh, president of Harvard, you may uh, know, stepped away during the war to oversee the Manhattan Project. And he wrote a series of popular books after World War II in which he repeatedly decried any attempt to extrapolate from the natural sciences to human beings to use common methods to study people. He said in scientific analysis could say almost nothing about human behavior uh, because it missed, as you see in the middle here, the spiritual basis of individual freedom, uh, which was fundamental to uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Judaism. Uh, after World War II, a surprising number of social scientists themselves disavowed the very idea of a social science. 
So some of them, like the critical sociologist T. Wright Mills, tried out alternative terms like social studies, uh, but they, often they just call themselves humanists. And here's the anthropologist Alfred Kroeber, fairly late in his life, and he says, well, to be a social scientist is to meddle in other people's affairs, right? They're constantly going around trying to remake the social world instead of just understanding it. And it's a fundamentally manipulative authoritarian stance. He calls it clinical, prescribing for other people, making value judgments for other people. One source of this kind of humanistic tendency was the emigration of leading thinkers from Central Europe in the 1930s. Most of the emigres who worked in the social sciences uh, were deeply critical of how those fields were configured in the United States. They were typically fierce critics of scientism. So, uh, for example, this informed uh, the work that emigres did in helping up the field of uh, political theory, for example. Also, as you see here, realism and international relations. This is Hans Morgenthau, and he says the international scene is a domain of conflict, not reason, but he also says that's compounded by the philosophical error of scientism, which thinks reason is everywhere and everything. And then there are figures who reject liberalism entirely, even though that's a capacious category after World War II, but who sought alternatives to the welfare state. Uh, they often agreed that liberalism's main problem was its scientific orientation, which they blamed for these policies that they disliked. Uh, this is a central theme for the architects of the conservative movement, the new right, as it was called in the US uh, after World War II. And even the, the figures among them who we think of as emphasizing mainly politics and economics, like the ex-communist Whitaker Chambers. Here's his famous book, Witness. And he says, Stalinism comes directly out of the sciences. It's quantification, it's not Marx. Uh, conservatives often identify the humanities as part of the solution alongside religion, saying that both were reservoirs for a non-scientific view of the human person. At the other end of the political spectrum on the left, this understanding of science remained a minority view until the mid 1960s when it began to spread much more widely among radicals. But here's a post-war example, Dwight MacDonald, who published a socialist journal called Politics. Uh, and he said, the conservatives are partly right. We have to reject this idea of scientific culture, of science-driven progress. Radicals must begin their analysis with the human person. The root is man. So you have this enormous array of post-war commentators who argue that their society is infused with a faulty, in some way, scientific view of humanity. Where did this discourse come from? Uh, I'm gonna talk about the 1920s for a minute as the first of these five inflection points in American arguments about science and culture. And of course, there are European antecedents going back to the 19th century, but it's not a story of direct transmission. Americans didn't just notice those arguments and pick them up. There's a distinctive set of conditions that give rise, sometimes independently, to this critique that I've been describing in the 1920s U.S., a new perception of the contours and the sources of American culture. So if you look at back at the early architects of the U.S. humanities uh, in the late 19th century, figures like uh, Charles Eliot Norton at Harvard, they described their targets rather differently. They talked about industrialism, commercialism, a Philistine sensibility. In that same period, there were a lot of religious leaders who said Darwinism would be a dangerous cultural force if it spread to the general population, uh, but they generally assumed it hadn't, and, and probably with good reason. Ministers tended to be more theologically radical than their parishioners at that point. Uh, in the US, right up to the 1920s, almost everyone agreed that big business and the Protestant churches set the tone for the culture at large. But in the 1920s, an unprecedented set of cultural tendencies emerged and gave rise to this cluster of arguments and fears that I am analyzing here. Is that, um, uh, among other things, a dramatic acceleration of middle-class consumption in both kind and degree. It is even more crass and materialistic than its Victorian precursors and spread over a wider, much wider segment of the population. It is particularly focused on high-tech consumer goods and gadgets having the latest of this and that, keeping up with the Joneses, a kind of emphasis, a sort of conformist emphasis. So there is a, 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 a great wave of suburbanization, of course, in the 1920s, uh, growing use of automobiles. And then there are a whole series of other changes in that decade as well. Moral change, a loosening of personal morals in many circles, artistic avant-garde, modernism, 
uh, the early stirrings of religious pluralism, significant degree of secularization in the schools. And alongside these changes in behavior, there's also widespread popular interest in the social sciences, especially psychology. So some observers began to draw a line, a direct causal relation between the social and the intellectual developments, saying that these new patterns of behavior had been caused by the spread of new scientific theories of behavior. Uh, some religious critics, including Niebuhr, as I mentioned, adopted this view in the 1920s, although many fewer than later, but it's a remarkably varied group. Here's a, a, a theological modernist, a common target of fundamentalist criticism in the era of the Scopes trial, a huge defender of Darwinism, but he says to view human beings scientifically is to reduce them to animals. That's where he draws his line, like so many other people in the 20th century had and have done. Uh, but one of the key groups to develop this new approach in the 20s was anchored in the humanities, and these are the new humanists, a prominent set of cultural critics led by Irving Babbitt and Paul Elmer Moore uh, in the 10s and 20s. And by the 1920s, they feared that what they called a naturalist conspiracy against civilization had taken hold of the culture and tossed out uh, conventional forms of self-understanding. Studying people scientifically meant seeing their behavior as fully determined by non-rational forces, and that view uh, was quickly destroying the social order. I want to skim pretty quickly through the 30s, but there are a couple of very, very important changes in that era. Totalitarian regimes emerge abroad, and a growing number of critics uh, hold science responsible for those regimes, saying that a scientific mentality and culture inevitably produce a totalitarian society and state. And many of them, in fact, worried that the same thing was happening at home. The American welfare state was taking shape. Social scientists were flocking to Washington to staff the New Deal bureaucracies. And so the 1930s, with this uh, worry about state growth, brings a sharper and more political sense of the dangers of a scientific culture. These are specific models of what it seemed to produce. All right, fast forward to the 50s, another age of prosperity. Many of the trends from the 20s are amplified and on a much larger scale, more consumerism, more suburbanization, more educational changes, other new developments, uh, permissive parenting, opinion polling, bureaucratization, the growing centrality of experts. To many commentators, all of this uh, reflected science's implicitly totalitarian influence. And they often focused on the highly manipulative orientation of the behaviorist psychologist B.F. Skinner, who wanted to make people follow social norms through intensive programs of conditioning starting at birth. And one after another commentator over and over and over again said that Skinner's utopian vision reflected either the conscious beliefs and ambitions of social scientists as a whole or the inevitable outcomes of their guiding assumptions. Uh, in this period, Brave New World, which had been published quite a bit earlier, was a constant point of comparison for those who were alarmed by Skinner's emphasis on the power of social conditioning, this seeming evacuation of moral freedom and choice. Now moving ahead, similar themes echo through the revolts of the 1960s. Uh, this is especially common among older theorists who are trying to put the upheavals in a larger historical context and interpret their deep meaning. You see Marcuse and Rozak here in that category. Uh, but a concern with the dehumanizing potential of a technocratic society, and that language of dehumanization ran through the everyday activism of the era as well. By the 70s, also as part of the New Left, another portrait of scientific uh, culture had emerged among young radicals. And this is a pretty different kind of critique. It fits into my frame, uh, but in a different way. It says here, science isn't dangerous because it has pushed aside a conventional understanding of human behavior. That was the typical mid 20th century argument. It's actually dangerous because it upholds a conventional understanding of human behavior. In this case, the idea that race and sex shape behavior. So that science uh, anchored prejudice and discrimination by asserting that there were natural and changing categorical differences between social groups. This was the faulty understanding of humanity that science was spreading through the culture. And this is a pattern they start to turn back toward the critique of biology as well as the social sciences, because that's such a central field here. There are other important changes as well, especially by the 70s, obviously the 
the counterculture gives way uh, gives rise to an array of new age sensibilities, explorations of alternative ways of knowing that were set uh, partially or wholly against the scientific mainstream. This is when the Christian right uh, came together, challenging again Darwinism as well as the social sciences. Uh, but back in the universities, moving to our last inflection point here in the 80s and 90s, as critical scholars sought to understand patterns of domination more deeply, the emergence of post-structural critiques brought out some of the older themes again, sweeping critiques of Western modernity, dating back centuries and rooted in something, some feature of science, rather than this more immediate focus has, had been uh, uh, more common in the 60s and 70s on post, specific post-war American formations. At the same time, the diversification of elite universities brings into the disciplines not only demographic minorities, but also uh, circles of religious traditionalists. And these figures uh, sounded many of the same notes as their post-war predecessors, figures like Sheen and Niebuhr, uh, about the disintegrating effects of modern science, uh, thoroughly scientific culture dominated by relativism, determinism, materialism, detachment devoid of substantive values. Traditionalists in the late 19th, uh, 20th century combined these arguments with certain postmodern sensibilities, especially the emphasis on difference, uh, sharing in a sharp critique of universalism, which they associated with science as the repressive keynote of modernity. So how do these themes resonate in our own time? Uh, I came to the center at a, a fortuitous moment in the fall of 2013 because a renewed battle over scientism in, the, in that uh, terminology was unfolding in the journals. Some of you might remember this. Uh, on the one side was Leon Wieseltier of the New Republic. He used his Brandeis graduation address in May of 2013 to describe humanity students as the resistance. They were the saving remnants in what he called a glittering age of both technologism and scientism. And uh, he, he issued a number of other critiques of scientism and writing at around the same time. Now, the leading voice on the other side, you may not be surprised to hear, was uh, psychologist Steven Pinker, uh, who said that modern science is simply helping to answer timeless human problems on which little progress had uh, uh, ever been made before. Uh, it did so in the first instance by ruling out all traditional religions as possible explanations of anything. And he says, science can infuse every domain of morality, culture, politics with new insights. If only the humanities scholars and other recalcitrants would just let it in and combine its findings with their own distinctive methods. So at the start of the conclusion to the book, I recount this exchange very briefly, and then I insist that these kinds of arguments with these huge generalizations about science, reason, religion, the humanities, uh, just don't help when we're trying to figure out how to respond to a particular issue around science and technology, say artificial intelligence. Very specific techniques, views of the person, values at stake, social interests, uh, not science as a whole, reason as a whole, religion as a whole. We can't get any traction on the situation by simply choosing one of those grand abstractions over another. Uh, but that's still a fairly broad kind of point. Let me finish by saying a few more words about where I stand even more concretely. What do I think the critics described in this book, uh, including Wieseltier in this case, uh, got right and wrong? Here's the argument again. Let's look back at the three points. What the critics got right in my view was their epistemological analysis, uh, part number one here. Uh, well, that's not quite true. Uh, a sort of broader sense that uh, science can't tell us everything, okay? if they try to say that there is a fully scientific view of uh, human behavior, that would be faulty, I think. Um, but the, the, the ge more general point uh, that science uh, uh, doesn't and can't do everything, but of course, tons of scientists agree with that, right? Many of them see their theories and concepts as heuristic tools, models, not total pictures or absolute truths, uh, as their critics so often say they do. Uh, disagreements between them and between them and other people, you know, often focus or, or should focus on which models work where, not whether science is all encompassing. And then on the second point, I, I don't agree that the views of scientists set the tone for the wider culture. It would be a very, very different world if they did, uh, for better and for worse. 
But there are just so many other forces too, as I explained in the conclusion, cultural forces, political forces, even emotional forces, and then the sheer uh, weight of inertia on top of it all. So if that's true, then the third tenet is also wrong. Science is not the source of our social problems. It's not irrelevant, it's not blameless, uh, but science is just one of many pursuits that take their shape from broader social dynamics rather than determining those dynamics. We need to look at power, we need to look at institutions. If we think about injustice, for example, the case for science's influence is strongest in areas like race, gender, sexuality, where science until quite recently upheld conventional bigoted views to considerable effect, although many other institutions did too. But if we're talking about some of the other big phenomena that are sometimes traced to science, capitalism, bureaucracy, individualism, atomization, uh, these are relatively freestanding systems with their own logics. They often enlist science, they aren't created by it. So I would insist that the humanities aren't and shouldn't try to be the anti-sciences. That Weasel Tier is wrong to identify these fields as the antidote to a science-obsessed society. Uh, this misrepresents science's influence and it also ignores many points of commonality between uh, the sciences and the humanities. And then on the other side, uh, Pinker is wrong to imply that science, or to state really, that science in combination with a few simple moral principles can just tell us how to behave in the world. Uh, that we can, as we hear so often in the pandemic, just follow the science. Pinker says we can get a full-fledged scientific morality applicable all around uh, if we combine established facts with a simple imperative to maximize the flourishing of humans, humans and other sentient beings. But of course, who decides what flourishing means? We might be able to agree on some very broad principles, but this is almost meaningless as a formulation. And also when it comes to socially relevant issues, what science usually gives us is, is an assessment of probability of risk, not certainties, not clear cut causal relations, just rough percentages that tell us almost, almost nothing about what to expect in individual cases, including our own cases, which are the ones that matter the most to us. Uh, we have to decide for ourselves within the boundaries set by law and policy how to respond to what scientists say, uh, which risks to take and why. And that's even more true, of course, when the science isn't yet settled, as been, has been the case in the pandemic. And then on top of that, we face a further decision about how to behave toward others who disagree with us in terms of personal relations, but also public institutions, which policies to endorse. Uh, and I'll just conclude by saying this, to make those decisions, uh, decisions that account for science's findings but go far beyond them, you need a whole range of additional skills that the other disciplines can help us learn. It takes the knowledge of social dynamics, structures, and institutions fostered by the social sciences. You can learn about these in other ways through sort of immediate experience, but studying the social sciences is particularly effective. Uh, and of course, these decisions also take the kinds of historical and cross-cultural perspectives, interpretive skills, aesthetic sensitivities practiced in the humanities. Again, not the only source of these qualities, but an especially productive source. We live in a world where science and technology are constantly creating new forms of power, new capacities to change things around us, perhaps even to fundamentally alter our own bodies and minds. Uh, and that is a world which requires even more of the kinds of skills that the humanities at their best can cultivate. So thanks so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Andrew, for that exceptional summary of a book that I greatly enjoyed. And I must say that there has rarely been a book in which I have more looked forward to or anticipated your conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think I say that in part because you were so careful, so fair um, to your historical characters in laying out their arguments from, uh, from the early 20th century forward mm -hmm. in each generation uh, after generation of, of critics lambasting a vague abstraction in most cases called science that they called science. Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, you do, you lay out this, um, this extraordinary continuity of generations of critics, left, right, Jews, Catholics, evangelical Christians, uh, radical and reactionary critics using science as a kind of, at times, a kind of cartoon punching bag, a foil for all manner of critiques of modern life. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess one question I would ask of you, and, and that I think your book really demands, is why science? Why not one of the other uh, 
markers of the modern era that you, in fact, just mentioned, capitalism, nationalism, globalization, consumerism, bureaucracy, law, even sports, you notice, you note in your book, are all sort of markers of the waning of traditional religious authority. Mm -hmm. um, why not one of those other enemies? Why science? What is it that has made that particular abstraction so, so appealing? One of the reasons I wrote this book is to try to understand that tendency, uh, which is so common in so many circles, but it seems especially puzzling on the left in certain ways. Uh, you know, if you look back at the sort of iconic constructions of modernity in the late 19th century by German sociologists and so forth, you know, science doesn't play a huge role until you get really to Max Weber. Um, you know, it's really about cities, it's about business, it's about industry, it's about all kinds of social forms. Um, it's not really a philosophy per se, it's taken to, to come with a kind of way of being, a kind of mentality, a kind of sensibility, but it's not a kind of derivation of a philosophical foundation. And I think one of the reasons I wrote this book is, it, and I'm not sure I've really answered it for myself, is why it is that so often critics of, say, capitalism or of technocracy, which I still think is quite different from science, uh, keep sliding back into that philosophical mode, that kind of foundational reasoning to say that if we could only find an intellectual root, then we could kind of tear this whole thing up, you know, at the, at the very base. Uh, and I think it's uh, wrong. I think it's dangerous. I think it's counterproductive. Um, I think it tends to reduce the world to terms that academic intellectuals can manage more easily. And there's a constant temptation in that way. It, it tells us that the practices in which we are engaged are very, very important in a kind of world historical sense. I mean, there's, it's not that science has nothing to do with the modern world, and it's not that it doesn't have its flaws. Um, but I, I have tended to, to see modern societies as more uh, conflictual, as having more power centers, more different kinds of clashing institutions than I think has been typical among critical scholars over the last several decades. There's been a very strong tendency to tell hegemony stories in which there's a sort of single interlocking structure or a single center of power and it's uh, sort of intellectual and cultural tentacles are sort of gotten into everything and so that there's a there's one system in a sense that can be attacked and conveniently in sort of one place and I just don't think that's the way the world works and, and that one of the uh, one of the functions of this kind of critique is I think as a kind of intellectual shortcut uh, to sort of make the task seem easier in a way that, I mean, what would seem harder than destroying modernity? But on the other hand, if it's if it, you can find it in one place and start to work on that, that that's a kind of simple, if huge task. Whereas I actually think the story is even more complicated. If our struggles have a lot to do with human foibles or inertia or, you know, just, uh, just very basic kind of on the ground kinds of forces, uh, they, they get that much harder to handle. One of the most striking. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, we need pardon. to know that in order to attack them. Yeah. One of the most striking things about the book is, as you work us through the decades, it's truly a tour de force of, of critiques of science and scientism over time. Um, is the astonishing coalitions, or perhaps I might say, sometimes unknown coalitions of critics. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in your presentation just now, you you noted ex Marxists. Um, paired with um, evangelical Christians, sometimes in the same decade, attacking um, this, uh, this vague abstraction that they're both calling science as the source of the evils that they, can, that they perceive in the world. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is really remarkable, actually, that um, such diverse groups of critics could find a common enemy in that sense. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's a wonderful article that they actually, it's the, it's the picture on my on uh, my screen here, on my, on my uh, cover slide, is taken from an article in the New York Times by the traditionalist conservative Russell Kirk. It's one of his many critiques of the uh, social sciences, and he's famously rebutted there by Robert Merton, uh, the sociologist. But Kirk goes, and you just go through his <laughs> notes and citations and the people he calls out by name in the article, and he's citing Jacques Barzun, right, this kind of establishment liberal of a kind, although he's more conservative than uh, even the sort of later label of him as a neoconservative would suggest he thought that people who did antisocial things should be put to death, like drag racing. Um, but um, he's citing uh, 
Atiram Sorokin, who's a kind of now obscure sociologist who was a, considered a socialist for a while and became a kind of social conservative. He's citing C. Wright Mills. He's citing folks from all over the political spectrum on this single issue of kind of a broad humanism versus scientism. And I talk some in the middle chapters about nascent attempts to create axes around this, uh, w w you know, sort of alliances around this particular axis, and particularly those around uh, Russell Kirk, it plays a very important role here in trying to bring together people like uh, Sidney Hook, who had been on the left and still was considered a kind of a liberal um, anti-communist with, you know, some of the most right-wing folks that were publishing in that day. So yeah, really, really remarkable. It just, I, I can't overestimate or stress enough how vague some of the mid 20th century versions are, especially they're just totally detached from any institutional consideration. There's occasional mentions of education, crime, the welfare state, but so often they just float so freely that anyone could pick them up. So there are two questions in the chat from our YouTube audience that I think merit attention. In some ways, they, they might actually go together. Okay. Um, the first is a comment about, um, or a question rather, about the ways that um, scientists' warnings about climate change have been ignored or suppressed. And one, um, one of our viewers, one of your viewers asks, is this part of the critique of scientism? You actually have a very interesting comment about climate change and the way that humanists and STS scholars have responded to that particular um, scientific question. Yeah. Um, and the other question from our audience, I, I do think is related. Um, it, it is, this is a sort of uh, so what question for you, I think. How do humanists and scientists better advocate for our commonality and intersections? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's very, very important. Uh, I think on the first question, I would say that, you know, th this particular structure of argumentation isn't necessarily applicable to every case. There are lots and lots of kinds of critiques of science, modes of skepticism that don't take this form and yet are very, very important and consequential. So there is this huge array in the late 20th century emerging uh, anti-nuclear movements, you know, anti-GMO movement that don't necessarily trade in these huge philosophical abstractions or talk about necessarily science as a, a unified whole, but take, uh, you know, take on very particular kinds of applications um, in particular kinds of domains, particular, especially those related to human health, but not always. Um, and those have a different kind of structure. They, they are part of a, of a kind of uh, holistic, synthetic understanding of skepticism towards science. They don't follow the thread that I'm tracing in this book, so they're, they're relatively marginal in there. But I think the climate crisis is a really important one because I think, I think what part of what it shows, the climate crisis and more recent, uh, well not, they're not more recent, but uh, started more recently, um, controversies around masking and vaccination and so forth in the pandemic. I think you do see there in the background this underlying perception of not even science so much as scientists uh as kind of moral aliens right has folks who just have different values different perspectives that just sort of aren't us in a way right that are really uh, in some ways quite actively subversive maybe along with these washington liberals and bureaucrats that there's some kind of nascent attempt to sort of undermine our freedoms and so forth there's a sense of them as sort of quasi-communistic they're all of these sorts of associations that were hammered home in so many different ways through these kinds of critiques that I'm talking about. All of those decades of people portraying science as something that was destroying our culture and our society, I do think there are very, very strong resonances in some of the specific kinds of fears today. Now, there are obviously roles for uh, particularly Republican leaders and, and other kinds of conservatives in the climate uh, science debates, you know, very, very clear and active attempts to portray environmentalism as a harm to business in the 1970s and beyond, a very clear mobilization after the 1994 Republican wave in Congress to bring climate skeptics to, uh, to these hearings and so forth. And you do see public belief in climate change drop fairly precipitously at that point. So these things are effective, but it's also waiting there to be mobilized, this underlying reservoir of concern, fear about exactly who 
uh, especially, but not entirely and not exclusively, uh, social scientists are and what they're doing. Uh, as far as common interests, so this is something I've been pushing for my whole career. I think one of the other reasons I write this kind of work is that I think that the usual ways in which we contend with one another for money, resources, space, and so forth are, are uh, unfair and counterproductive. Uh, they tend to uh, fuel critiques from the outside without really changing anything uh, for the better on the inside, whereas I think we'd be better off as scholars presenting a more unified front on behalf of the things that really matter to us the most, what we care about in a scholarly life, in an academic life, the ways in which we think carefully about evidence, the kinds of styles of work life that we want. I think there are many, many ways, uh, we don't have to reduce them to one another, but in which the various disciplines really do have quite a bit in common. And, the, and by constantly, not only criticizing one another, but particularly by blaming one another for this these massive historical phenomena that we couldn't possibly be responsible for. I think that that's really, really counterproductive and dangerous. That's a nice suggestion that we begin with humility. Mm, um, there's a, a comment in the, or a question rather, in the, uh, in the uh, chat here that I think speaks to something you just mentioned. Um, and the question is that it, it seems clear that there's a partisan divide in the present moment yeah. regarding the reliability of science as a basis for public policy. That is to say, one of the two major parties has, has explicitly attacked science as a reliable tool for public policy. And the, the question at is, uh, was this also the case in earlier periods? Was there a democratic position on science and a Republican position on science in, in the period before 1994 that you mentioned? No, there really wasn't. Um, nothing like this at all. And I think it's really quite remarkable. I mean, the, the parties were in some ways less similar than they are today, in some ways more similar than they are today in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, but you did not have in any large party faction that I could think of this kind of organized skepticism toward the sciences. Now, you know, you might say they weren't really a factor. There was nothing to sort of look at until World War II when they start to become integrated into the state apparatus in various kinds of ways. Uh, but even then, you did not really have a breakdown along party lines um, there at all. I think, um, yeah, now that, that's been really, really interesting to watch as uh, the parties have become more tribal in a sense, one of the markers of belonging has become this kind of resistance. And yet, as I say in the introduction, there are all kinds of issues that span a left-right or Republican-Democrat divide. Uh, so, you know, the vaccination campaign, that you know, this, this new one in the pandemic has its own dynamics, but the modern anti-vaccination sentiment since the 1990s has been all over the map in terms of politics. I mean, there's some groups that are more reliably committed to that than others, but you find it among, you know, hippie homeschoolers and you find it sort of all over the place. It's a certain kind of um, fear of the medical establishment and so forth. Um, some issues are mostly on the left, genetically modified foods. Uh, not a huge issue for most conservatives that I know of, right? A very big issue for a lot of folks farther to the left on the political spectrum. Uh, biotechnology all across the map, where you can find people of just about every political persuasion who think that it's repugnant to think about manipulating our bodies and our genes. Um, so on the, the big kind of newspaper type uh, issues, climate change obviously enormously important, uh, or sometimes when battles over Darwinism are in the front pages, you know, those, are, those are very partisan and, and um, but even as late as five years ago, it wasn't nearly as partisan as, as it is today, except on climate change and certain things related to uh, uh, reproductive technologies. So these are shifting patterns still. They seem to be moving in one direction, and yet there are always counterweights on the other side. We all find things that we don't like in science and technology, and we have to try to figure out how to handle them. Um, usually, because we respect science so much, we have to write them off as bad science. Uh, and that's an interesting dynamic in itself. One of the productive uh, distinctions that I think productive distinctions you make in the book is between science and te technology, mm -hmm. um, that the applications of science should not be 
conflated with the method itself or with its approaches or with the people doing the work necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet there has been a tendency to do so. And I'm, I'm reminded of that um, by this very point, which is that both left and right seem to enjoy very much and celebrate certain aspects of technological development, which of course initiate with scientific research um, and yet you know, despise or fear other markers, um, sometimes even within the same general field yeah. Uh, such as within agriculture or within uh, agricultural technology. Yeah. And a lot of those who have tried to, to draw that distinction have done it to push back on what you just said, which is to say that a lot of technologies and engineering innovations don't necessarily uh, just sort of spring full full blown out of the sciences. So there's been a lot of uh, debate over that particular kind of relationship. One thing that's happened in the scholarship, and I think this is reflective of, of the particular character of uh, biotechnology and the biosciences these days in that the, the distance between discovery and application has shrunk to almost zero. There's been a tendency among a lot of scholars in science and technology studies, especially to use the construct technoscience as a single entity. And I do, as you say, push back on that for a variety of different reasons. I think that's more uh, more applicable in certain kinds of times than others. Um, but there are these questions that, that, that you were raising just a second ago. What is the relationship between scientific research and technological innovation? Sometimes it does go this way. Sometimes uh, it goes a different direction, right? Sometimes the science is done to try to figure out why something works that engineers have done. Um, but in all those cases, I think there is still something productive in trying to keep sight of that distance because if for the for the for the purpose of resisting the kinds of criticism that I'm writing about here in the book, which is to say that if if a particular technology has some kind of effect that we don't happen to care for, we shouldn't necessarily just immediately go back and see that as reflecting on the scientific enterprise as a whole or any particular discipline or something like that. I think we need to think about things in more particularistic terms. Maybe this is just the historian speaking and we need to sort of get down to, to more concrete cases um, but I think that's my tendency is to want to go in the direction of the particulars rather than to engage in these very, very broad generalizations, because I just don't find them that helpful personally. And I wonder how many people do. What a wonderful statement from the humanities about the role of the humanities and their value. And I must say that as someone who worked in STS field myself and worked for many years with scientists and collaborations continue to do so, mm-hmm. I find the kind of um, humble, interested, and deeply educated approach that you've taken in this wonderful book to be a in our society. Um, Andrew Jewett, it's been a real honor to have you with us tonight. We're reaching the end of our time together, and I want to give the, the closing outro, but um, thank you for joining us tonight and for sharing your views with all of us. It's been great fun. Well, thank you, Andrew this evening and for your interesting questions. This event has been recorded and will be available on the National Humanities Center's YouTube channel. Please click the subscribe button and the notify bell to be notified of future events from the center. You may also visit nationalhumanitiescenter.org to learn more about the center's work in support of humanities scholarship, teaching, and public understanding. Good evening, everyone, and stay well.